Welcome everybody to TechCraft, this is Rob. And in today's video, I'm gonna talk you through the workflow and the tools I use for remote coding on the iPad. Let's go. In part one of this series, we saw how to write and run code locally on the iPad. Now, running code on the iPad locally is a really important part of my workflow, and I really enjoy writing utilities for the iPad with something like Pythonista, but I do the bulk of my coding on remote servers using the iPad as the primary access device. I have two main remote coding workflows that I use in my work. I connect to various remote machines over SSH for backend coding, and I use Jupyter running on a remote server for data science and machine learning. In this video, we'll dive into both of these workflows. The iPad has two solid SSH apps that I know about, Prompt and the one that I use a lot, Blink. So Blink gives you everything you'd expect in a normal SSH client. You can configure your keys to access the servers you want to uh, shell into. You can pre-configure certain hosts so you don't have to type out all the addresses each time. And of course, the most important thing, you can choose the appearance you want. You can choose your theme and your font and your font size, so forth. There's also pretty decent support for keyboard remapping. So if we take a look at the keyboard tab here, you can see that I've, for example, remapped caps lock to be control. I use control a lot in the shell and you'll see why shortly. I've also been able to make the back quote key as escape, which if you're a Vim user is obviously super important. Now I have this really useless key up here, the one with the kind of double S on it that I'd like to make into escape, but that's not supported so far, which is obviously kind of frustrating. And it's even more frustrating that you can't remap these keys globally in iOS. I'd really like to have caps lock B control everywhere on the operating system. So Blink has a built-in kind of mini bash shell. If you press tab once you're inside it, you'll see all the commands that it supports. So for example, we can query DNS and you can use read line style keyboard shortcuts to scroll through the history with control P for previous and control N for next. Once you've got a line that you want to edit, control A takes you to the beginning and control E takes you to the end and then control B to go backwards and control F to go forwards. This is a big part of why I've rebound the caps lock key to be control. It's just far more convenient for me to hit caps lock and do this than it is to hit the control key way down here on the keyboard. So SSH works exactly as you'd expect. Once you're inside Blink, you just simply run the SSH command and you use the server you want to connect to. So I'm gonna to connect to my server in AWS and there I am inside my server. You'll notice I didn't need to type in a password there. That's because SSH keys are fully supported. And as we saw earlier, you can configure them in the config tab. Once I'm connected to the remote machine, I just have my normal environment that I use everywhere. So I'm using Vim for the editor, but if you're an Emacs person or if you're into Nano, then you can use all of those. Basically any command line editor will work just fine. I also have whatever programming language tools I need. I have Git and we'll return to Git in a second. And I also have the most important tool in my workflow, which is Tmux. So if you're not familiar with Tmux, the name means terminal multiplexer, which is basically just a fancy way of saying it's a program that allows you to have multiple terminals running just in a single terminal window. In practice, this means that I can have my editor open in one window, say here, and then using the Tmux keyboard shortcuts, I can create another window. I can split this one horizontally. In one of those splits, I can run, say, my application, and then in another, I can interact with something like Git. And this is just a basic window layout. Obviously, you can create more complex layouts to your specific needs, but this isn't the only thing I use Tmux for. It has one other killer feature that is absolutely indispensable for my workflow. This whole set of terminal windows is called a session in Tmux land, and I can detach from this session, leaving everything still running. I can then disconnect from SSH, I can come back to the machine at a later point, fire up SSH and reattach to the exact same Tmux session with all my applications still running exactly as I left them. If you're very mobile like me, I'm maybe grabbing 15 minutes here and there to do some work. This is absolutely ideal. I can chill in, do some work, detach from Tmux, maybe find another 15 minutes later in the day, just reattach and pick up where I left off. I don't have to worry about kind of restarting my entire environment. There's just so much more to Tmux than I can really even show in this video. I will throw some links to the guides in the description below, but if you're interested in seeing a video about it, then do hit me up in the comments and I'll happily film something. So I've mentioned Git and GitHub a few times now. Both are indispensable parts of my workflow. To access my private Git repositories, I'm using SSH. And to avoid the hassle of having to put my SSH keys onto different remote machines, like my AWS machine, I'm using SSH forwarding. 
Let me just say at this point that you shouldn't use SSH agent forwarding for machines that you don't have complete trust in. Now, I'm pretty comfortable with the level of trust for the machines that I use, and it's a huge convenience boost for me. But if you're not all that comfortable with your machines, then you should look for another solution. To get agent forwarding running in Blink, you need to explicitly start the SSH agent in a dedicated Blink terminal before connecting to your servers. Once the agent is running, you need to add your key to it using the SSH add command. Normally, you do this with a file path, but in Blink, you use the key name that is shown in the keys config page. You can check that the key has been added correctly using SSH add L. When connecting to your server now, add in the dash A flag to enable agent forwarding. On your remote server, you can check that the key has been forwarded correctly again using SSH add L. I can now happily access my private GitHub repositories without having to copy my keys across to AWS. So that's my SSH coding workflow. Let's now take a look at the workflow I use for data science with Jupyter. So first things first, if you're gonna use Jupyter, you need a Jupyter installation. If you're using Jupyter professionally at work, or if you're maybe studying data science at university or college, then you'll probably already have access to a Jupyter installation. If you're using Jupyter at home, however, for hobby projects, then there are plenty of ways you can get hold of Jupyter. You can, of course, install it on one of your own machines. I actually have it running on an old Mac Mini, which I use all the time for my own hobby projects. If you don't want to install Jupyter yourself at home, there are plenty of cloud-based services you can use. Two that I think are great for hobbyists are Microsoft Azure and Binder. Both are free, both offer relatively limited compute resources, but for hobby projects, they're absolutely fine, and they are supported in Juno Connect, which is the application that we'll take a look at very shortly. If you are going to install your own Jupyter, then I highly recommend that you install Anaconda, which is a great open source Python data science distribution that comes complete with Jupyter and has an amazing command line interface for managing your installation. Once you've installed Jupyter, you need to start it running and you do that using the Jupyter notebook command. Now by default, this server will only listen on local host, so you can't actually access it from your iPad. What you need to do is generate a config file using the dash dash generate config flag. You can then edit this config file and change the bind IP addresses to be all IP addresses for your host machine. It also makes sense to create a password at the same time, just to add a little bit of extra security. And my preference for running Jupyter is to run it inside Tmux so that when I disconnect from the machine, the Jupyter keeps running. So once you've got a running Jupyter instance, you can access it directly from Safari. Since Safari got its upgrades in iOS 13, this is completely feasible, but I really prefer using it from within an application called Juno Connect, which provides a much nicer, more native style experience. Once you open Jupyter Connect, you'll see that there's easy access to a few of the common cloud compute services, such as Azure and Binder. But for this demo, I'm just gonna to connect to my Mac mini so that we're not at the whims of the internet. If you're already using Jupyter, then the Juno interface will look very familiar to you. Basically though, you have a simple file browser here showing you all the files in your project. You can click on any of the notebooks to bring them up and work on them and make changes. It's really quite powerful. I can install any module that I want here. I'm not limited like I was in Pythonista that we saw in part one to just native Python modules. So if I needed to install something like TensorFlow, for example, I can do so really easily in my Jupyter installation. Now to install, packages, you need to open up a terminal. And of course we could just use SSH and SSH into the Mac mini and do it that way. But Jupyter has its own built-in terminal window. So I can really easily just click here to open up a terminal and run the requisite commands in Anaconda to install TensorFlow. These built-in Jupyter terminal windows are also a great way to interact with Git for your project. If you are doing serious data science work, or even if you're just doing a long hobby project, it does make sense to store that project in somewhere like GitHub. And there you'll, you'll definitely want to issue Git commands to update your project. And for that, I just use these inbuilt Jupyter terminal windows. So those are the apps that I'm using. A mixture of Blink and Juno really does cover off the vast majority of the work I'm doing on remote servers. But the question really remains like, where do these remote servers come from? And I actually have three options that I use on a regular basis. So I obviously use my MacBook Pro as a destination to SSH into. Enabling SSH on the Mac is really easy. If you open up system preferences, then go into sharing, all you need to do is click here on the remote login button. Then you can log in 
over SSH using your own username and password. I basically leave my MacBook Pro on my desk and then I can connect to it from wherever I am. I have a VPN into my house, so really easy for me to get access to that laptop wherever I am. The only limitation I have is it's not really Linux and I do a lot of my work on Linux. So I do like to use a Raspberry Pi as well for work that requires real Linux. And I just have this little Model 3 that I carry with me if I really needed to. You can power it from the USB socket in the iPad, so it's really quite convenient. and. It's only got one gig of RAM, so I am thinking about upgrading to the Model 4, but it's been great, and I like to play around with it and do various things on it. I've got like maybe three or four of these now, all running different kinds of services that I control from the iPad over SSH. I also like to keep a cloud virtual server around as well, and for that, I'm using Amazon Web Services. With AWS, you can get one virtual CPU and one gig of RAM in a virtual server for free on their free tier. So I just keep that running all the time, and it's there if I need it. It isn't really sufficient for heavy coding work, but for simple hobby projects and for managing my website and for just doing like config file tweaks, it's absolutely perfect and it's free. There are loads of alternatives to Amazon Web Services as well. Specifically, Linode and DigitalOcean offer really cheap virtual servers that I've had a lot of success with in the past. So I haven't really found a good app to manage AWS resources. So for that, I wrote a really simple script in Pythonista that I use to start and stop my server. So AWS provides this templating service called CloudFormation where you can just describe what you want your server to look like, what firewall rules you want, those kinds of things. I maintain that template in Git, and then I use this simple script just to sync my template with what's running in the cloud. And both of these things are available for free on my GitHub if you want to copy them. So the question remains, why use the iPad and not a MacBook Pro? Why not use a laptop? And a lot of people in the comments have asked that question. And for me, it's really two things. The first thing is, it's not really a question of iPad on one hand versus MacBook on the other hand. For me, it's a question of iPad and MacBook versus just iPad. I need my iPad all the time. I use it for calendaring, email, note-taking, all those kinds of things. And I find it to be a far superior device to a laptop for those kinds of use cases. So then if I can get away with just carrying my iPad, then a trip for me or a commute into work is a much more pleasurable experience. And when I'm coding, I'm using Vim anyway, I'm using a terminal anyway, I'm using Tmux anyway. So the experience is not that different for me. I'm using Jupyter anyway. The end result for my workflow is basically the same, except I have a slightly smaller screen, but I have much better battery life and I have a lighter travel bag. Now, there are some things I cannot do on the iPad. So I'm just starting to get into writing iOS apps and I have not found a way of doing that on the iPad that is at all palatable. So I'm still doing that on my MacBook. And although I'm having some success now doing my video editing on the iPad as well, I still prefer doing that on the laptop because that's just a workflow that I'm very, very familiar with. However, I do think that one will transfer to the iPad over time. So I really hope you found this video useful. There are of course many more topics regarding coding on the iPad that I could talk about. And if there's anything you really want to see a video about, throw a comment below and I'll see what I can do. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, and don't just hit subscribe, but hit the bell as well so you don't miss out on any future content. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.